And just as our panellists are having their final microphones being put on, I will introduce the panel from my right along to my left so that everyone is ready to go. On my far right, we have Lord Wallace, who is Liberal Democrat spokesman from Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the House of Lords, and of course, eminent European expert. Andrew Ledson, Conservative MP, who has all sorts of important roles, but in this context is part of the Fresh Start Research Project, which Conservative MPs have been carrying out over the last 18 months or so. And next Wednesday they will be publishing what they believe is the way ahead for the European Union. Then on my left you have Richard Ashworth, MP, who is the leader of the Conservatives in the European Parliament. And then Mary Honeyball, Labour and MEP for London. Now what we're going to try and do in this session, with your help, and we do want lots of questions as well, is really to <clears throat> try to get out a giant crystal ball, um, to indulge in the foolish art of trying to predict what is going to happen, but nothing really could be more timely than having this conversation when, right now, when in a matter of weeks, on the 22nd of January, David Cameron will give his very long promised speech about how he really thinks the UK's relationship with the EU should evolve. Other countries have recently started to weigh into the debate as to whether or not we should have a public vote on our part in the Union. And even really in the last few days, the business community has started to speak up on its view about whether or not we should be trying to change the relationship that we've had. So, Andrea, firstly to you. As a prominent backbencher, and as somebody with a particular interest in this subject, what would you like David Cameron to say when he's going to set the January? And what, realistically, can he say? Well, I would hope that the first thing he'll do is to point out the fact that actually the status quo for Britain isn't an option. And that, I think, you know, in the earlier session didn't really come out. But the reality is that with the Eurozone crisis, and particularly in recent weeks with the European Banking Union moves, there is no way that you, the EU will ever be the same again in the future. And so Britain, as a non-Euro member country, has to define its own new relationship with the EU. So I think that that's the first key point that he needs to, to make, is that just standing still, carrying on as we are, isn't an option. And then secondly, what I hope he'll be doing is, um, is, is, is giving full warmth to the fact that we completely understand and appreciate and support the need for those Eurozone member countries to move towards greater fiscal integration. And that we want that to happen for them because, of course, it's not in Britain's interest for the Eurozone crisis to continue or indeed for the Euro to break up. And then the third thing I hope he'll be saying is that, um, however, Britain needs to articulate its own vision of its relationship with the EU. I don't personally think we could go for a sort of Norway or Switzerland or, or Turkey style relationship. Britain needs to be a member of the EU at the heart of the EU. But as a non-Euro member, as a, as a country that is not going down the route of a federal state of Europe, we need to have our own articulation, and that's where the work I've been doing with the Fresh Start project comes in. We've been trying to define that over the last 18 months. And what does that actually look like? I mean, I think a lot of people would give those sorts of things and say, well, we need to have a new relationship. But in brass tacks, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that um, what Britain wants to achieve is a better deal for ourselves in terms of our civil and political society. Um, in areas particularly like, for example, the Social and Working Time Directive, where we've actually had coroners cite as a contribution to the cause of death the Working Time Directive's impact on doctors' hours. Um, that sort of thing has to stop. So certainly I'd be calling for the Prime Minister to be talking about repatriating competence in the area of social and working time. Um, other examples would be uh, Britain's ability to defend its own welfare system from... Um, from migration from the rest of Europe for the purpose of benefiting from Britain's welfare system. Those things will be terribly important going forward with successful EU enlargement. On the other hand, what Britain wants to see is the continuation of the single market um, for the EU to make far greater efforts. At the moment, only something like 2.5% of the EU budget is spent on negotiating trade. And what we want to see is far greater focus on trade, particularly in the services sector, and negotiation of free trade agreements with some of the big emerging economies that would actually be fantastic for Britain's financial services and other sectors. But those are all EU measures that um, I'm hoping David Cameron will be promoting in his big speech. And of course there's a different debate about whether or not some of those things can be achieved anyway without negotiations, but that's another point we'll, we'll come on to. Now, as 
of course we are in a country governed by a coalition. It's all in a very interesting position. Um, Lord Wallace, if David Cameron stands up and says the status quo is not an option, that we should repatriate powers in the social areas, we should repatriate powers like the Working Time Directive, what, would, what will your party do? I haven't seen the speech. He's giving the speech as a Conservative, uh, and as you know, there are differences between the two coalition parts on this. He's likely to give it in another like minded country. The Hague. Um, the so. So it is a little bit tweeted, um, and um, if, as I expect, you will start by saying it is in Britain's national interest to remain a fully committed member of the European Union, of course the Eurozone will have to have a number of further uh, decisions which will be specific to the Eurozone, but we wish to remain fully engaged within what is already there with the geometry of and that um, we do, at the same time, wish to look with other countries at the balance of competences, then I will be quite happy with that. Um, I'm going to put in um, with David Lidington on Sunday. Both of us will be talking to different members of the, of the German government and parliament about the balance of competences exercise and how the Germans, will, we hope, will cooperate with us on this. We, the, we, you're always a constant negotiation. At the moment, we're, we're decentralizing the common fiscal policy, we're arguing about the future of the budget. Much of what I think Andrew wants is what we gain by full engagement with others, and we have many other allies. Um, Richard, does there have to be a renegotiation, a redefinition of the relationship if actually those things that Andrew or others want to achieve can be done already through negotiation? And as a Conservative working right in the heart, of the European institutions. Is there a risk in even having this debate for you? It really does concern me that we're raising the tempo on this whole debate right now. Uh, the heat, and heat is being raised on it to the point that expectations from all sides of the divide are becoming so great that we're sort of heading for a, a nuclear solution when, frankly, uh, an evolutionary solution is perfectly glaringly obvious. Um, I hope I wasn't here earlier, but I hope that credit was given to the achievement of the European Union post-war uh, in terms of peace and prosperity. I suspect it exceeded expectations at that time. But those solutions post-war Europe probably are not the same solutions as we need for the challenges today, which is a world which is being driven by the economies of the Far East, the emergence of Indonesia, of Mexico, of China, Southeast Asia, Russia. So we have to change. I'm sure the Prime Minister would say that the Eurozone needs to integrate more. That's an obvious solution, but I'm sure he'll also determine the position of those who do not wish to integrate so much to, uh, to such an extent. Uh, I see two problems here, two barriers that the United Kingdom is actually putting in its own way. Firstly, looking from Brussels towards Westminster, the, the noise which comes from it frankly sounds as if it's one against 27, them against us. And it simply isn't like that. The fact that it's taking an aggressive stance, one against 27, snarling like a sort of pit bull across the uh, English Channel, Actually, there are a lot of nations who are on our side, culturally, economically. For example, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, Czech Republic, and even Germany are very sympathetic and supportive to the views which we take. But quite frankly, when you're talking about partnerships here, we're making ourselves look pretty darn unattractive <laughs> to those people at present and pretty difficult to work with. So that's one barrier we're putting in our way. Frankly, I think the British press has not been helpful in that respect. Secondly, I, I do hope that the Prime Minister spells out that the interests of UK business, and that to the British people is the interests of your job, is well and truly vested in a successful European Union with a successful single market. Of course it's got to change, of course there's a huge amount of work to be done, but this constant forensic analysis of what's wrong with it means you're missing the point about what's right, but more to the point, you're missing the opportunities where you, the United Kingdom, could be, should be, showing the vision and the leadership and determination to achieve change. Actually, looking back, the United Kingdom should pat itself on the back. In large part. 
the single market. The two most beneficial changes uh, ever brought to the European Union were products in the United Kingdom. Today, actually in the United Kingdom, you've got that mountain to climb again. And it's even steeper and bigger than it was before. But I don't fear the job to be done. I don't fear the people we ought to do it with. But I do fear that whether the British people have still got that same vision, that drive, that determination and energy which brought all those benefits and changes before. Are we the same people? Are we still an outward looking, ambitious, uh, visionary nation? Or are we reverting into an introspective, negative uh, group of people? But argument, I mean, you've been very, very clear. You said it really does concern me that we are raising the tempo. It is your own political party that you're a member of that's been raising the tempo. <laughs> Not all. <laughs> it is your own leader who has been very clear about the need well, for redefinition. It is your own colleagues of yours like Andrea who are saying we have to have a new relationship, who have been raising the tempo. Yeah. You missed in the first session, I'm sure your old friend and colleague Bill Cash certainly raising the tempo. <coughs> it is being driven by UK domestic politics and your own party leader. I mean, have, have you told him this well, concern look, you have? In, in many respects they're right. Things have mm -hmm. to change. Things like the Working Time Directive, things like a lot of the social legislation. But they're making a political on this. Yeah, 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 but these things are imposing burdens on industry, and particularly small businesses, which frankly need all the help they can get right now. Uh, now, those things have to change, but the British public aren't being accurately informed. They think, oh, we'll be like Norway, and we'll opt out of all this. The truth is, if you like Norway, you get it all. Norway has to have the Working Time Directive. Norway has to have that social environment legislation. And you're not at the table being able to determine what the options are. And more to the point, you don't get the chance to have an opt-out at all. But it's, it's pretty clear from what you're saying. You're deeply worried about the leadership of your party's stance on all of this. No. <laughs> <laughs> yourself pretty clear. Um, Mary Honeywell, this is interesting for the Labour Party, isn't it? Because we don't quite know what you would think about a promise for a referendum and whether you would say that people shouldn't have a chance to say what they want. And we don't quite know what the Labour Party stands on all this is at the moment. So well, what, what is it? Ed Miliband has been very clear saying that now is not the time to have a referendum. Um, which I, I think is absolutely right. Uh, in, the, in the middle of economic difficulties, the Eurozone crisis and indeed our own economic problems, it would be a massive and unnecessary distraction to start talking about a referendum on the EU because clearly a referendum is not something you can just do just like that. It would be a huge, huge political event. And now is really not the right time but to do this. I'd like to actually say, said, he hasn't ruled it out, to be clear. He said, no, we shouldn't have one right now. But the Conservatives aren't also saying we should have one right now. I mean, this is a debate about some point in the future. Um, of course it is. Um, and uh, and I, I think uh, it, because we're, we're both ruling it out at the time, it's perhaps a, a little bit um, difficult and not very helpful to start talking about a referendum at this point in the process because it is actually not on the agenda of the political parties and I think probably not on the agenda of the most of the British people. What I would like to say is um, I, I think actually Richard's been very brave in saying the things that he has done and I have to say a lot of which I, I agree with. Um, and I think it's interesting that we have a polarity, not necessarily between the parties here, but between those of us who are there in the European Parliament, in the EU, working day in, day out, knowing how the organisation works. And we have come to, I think, rather different conclusions, maybe, from politicians in the UK. And I think that's extremely significant, because we do know about Europe, we do understand that there are 27 countries, and we do also understand that, by and large, these these member states talk to each other, negotiate things, and come up, sometimes after long deliberations, with agreed conclusions. And therefore, that, I think, demonstrates that this can be done. But it also shows, I think, just how much the current government's policies on the whole question of repatriating powers and bringing competencies back to the UK are out of touch with actually what happens in Brussels. You will need the agreement of all 26 other member states, for a start, who, given the way that the debate is being conducted <coughs> in this country, as Richard has already said, may not be too happy to, to do it. Um, and also, we need to take into account in this argument the whole question of the single market, which everyone agrees with, which is hugely beneficial to this country, which takes almost half of our exports. 
the single market actually depends on there being a level playing field or as near as a level playing field that you can get for the exporters and for the countries of the EU. So if you have huge disparities in employment law and conditions across the EU, you do not have a working single market that really makes any sense. And that needs to be taken into account in these negotiations and these discussions that the UK is having in a way that it hasn't been. The social agenda is very important for the single market and we really, really must take that on board. Andrea, what do you say particularly to what Richard has said, that at the moment the UK is making ourselves look pretty damned unattractive to work with and pretty difficult? And people, perhaps like yourself and some of your colleagues who are raising the tempo, are a matter of concern. Well, I, I actually am surprised to find myself saying I, I completely disagree with Richard because um, actually what's, what the, the real fundamental issue for the EU right now is a crisis of um, democracy. You know, you've got a situation, you've got almost half young people in Spain are now out of work. You've got massive problems and in your earlier session some of you saying, well, that's nothing to do with the EU. That's absolute nonsense. The reason they overspent, overborrowed was precisely because they were a part of the EU. The EU has to now become a country called EU in order to be able to generate the fiscal transfers that will be necessary for the EU to hold together. That's well, fundamental that is, change. I mean, that's a really important point. I mean, was that really why we had a global... You know, there was a, a, a crash in the US as well. There was a crash in other parts of the world. Absolutely. The European no, but, Union, so why, no, but this, this, this fudging point about how, you know, the Labour government always had <coughs> to say it was the bank's fault. It was nothing to do with the fact that we overborrowed and overspent in the UK that accounts for our public deficit. That is, of course, not the case. The reason why Southern Europe is in such dire straits is compounded by the banking crisis, but actually it was their own policy of borrowing and spending <coughs> on the back of low interest rates that were generated by the powerhouse of Northern Europe that has enabled them to get themselves into the mess they're in. And that's because they were in the EU. That is very clear. So for anybody to say that membership of the EU has nothing to do with the mess that the Eurozone is now in is just on cloud cuckoo land. So, so, to be perfectly honest, I think the tempo has to be hot because there are some very serious decisions that has to be taken. And I don't like the fact that so many people say, just stick with the way it is, just keep your head down, let's not talk about it. That's just a nonsense. You know, the, the, the reality is, <coughs> if the euro were to break up, if international markets were to decide that the euro was a basket case, let's get rid of it, they could do that. And it's just stupid and naive for people to go around saying, change isn't necessary, let's stop talking about this, it's just destabilising things. And also, on the very specific point about British politicians, I also don't agree with that. I personally have exceedingly constructive meetings with Nordic and Baltic amb ambassadors, with, with representatives from the German embassy and the French embassy, and they're very interested to know what is it that Britain wants. They have no interest in seeing Britain leave the EU either. That's not arrogance, it's just simple <coughs> stating of the facts we're a very important world power uh, with all the advantages for other European countries that they also recognise. We do need to work together on some of these things and I think it's only by raising the pressure, raising the tempo, having some very specific ideas that will actually bring people to the table to look for proper changes. I'll just bring Lord Wallace in in just a second. Do you acknowledge though that there could be, there is a risk from having a debate, particularly as we've seen in recent days from business leaders saying this is creating a climate of instability, people don't know what the future is going to look like, and some people are genuinely very worried about that. And certainly there are people who, after the, the veto, who are worried about the UK not getting into the room. There are people like Richard and others who say, now the UK is looking really difficult to work with. I think if you look to the very recent past and the negotiations over European Banking Union, that was a masterclass that points the direction in which we want to go. The Germans supported us in that, the double majority lock. That was an absolute game changer for the way in which the in countries and the out countries can work together to ensure. But that's, but that's a different question. No, it's not actually because it's, question, it's the question precedent. is does the debate and create instability that could have a risk of damage? I, I, I don't believe it does unless party leaders, particularly the government, started saying actually. 
actually one will just leave. That, I would agree, does then lead to instability. And that's where I take on those who say, you know, let's just leave because they need us more than we need them. That's completely wrong because that fails to accept the process of leaving would be utterly destabilising for Britain. You know, with our massive foreign direct investment as a stepping off point for the Europe, it's a huge advantage to us. Has a, has a risk of its own I, I, don't, I don't agree with what uh, people were saying, that it, it harms business. No, I don't. I think it's a healthy debate. I think actually to try and continue to bury this actually has far more of the result of creating that pressure cooker. Okay, thank you. Lord Wallace. Well, a lot I disagree with that. With <laughs> okay. Andrea's uh, economic analysis, I just would point out that the, the European country which suffered most from the financial crisis, which had the most domestic consequences in terms of disruption and unemployment, it was Iceland not a member of the European Union. Uh, so the idea that it's all because they're in the Eurozone that's happened is, is simply not on it. It's, it's well, not, that's not what I was saying. Well, no, well mm -hmm. never mind. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's an important uh, point here, which is, which is between a unilateralist approach and a multilateralist approach. Neil Kinnock is here. Neil will remember that in, in the Labour Party in the 1970s, the left defined itself by two things. One, being unilateralist. Two, being anti-European. And there, there was a problem with it, that sort of the UKIP uh, press and the UKIP overlapping right wing of the Conservative Party who want Britain to be unilateralist on the other, who wants to be one versus 26. Now, actually, as a process of continuing negotiation, negotiating within the 27 with a large number of countries who share our views and making sure that we don't, in the process, irritate everyone else so enormously that they don't actually want to give us the concessions that we're asking for. That's clearly the way forward. And I fear, and as Helen said earlier, we, have, we face this real problem, they read our press and we don't read theirs. Uh, I fear that at the present moment, levels of irritation with the old Brits are rising, and it's therefore getting more difficult for other countries to accept that a lot of the arguments we are making on a range of subjects, including the Working Child Directive, uh, are often reasonable, including reforming the open arrest world, for example are extremely reasonable, um, because the rhetoric which lies behind it, the sense that the British do believe that they need us more than we need them, therefore we can simply put our demands on the table and the left will have to accept it, um, gets to a point where we fail to achieve the objectives that we actually need. Yet is there not, though, in other countries now, some sense, for example, this morning, that the Dutch are ready also to stand up and say, look, we want to repatriate some powers too. You know, that, that idea of us being the only Brit in the oyster. Yeah. Well, is I, that, let's is say, that, is I, that I, fair or is that not I'm fair? involved in the battles of competition for you, so I'm, I'm sort of into this, because David Livington and, uh, and I and others are going to have to sort of see how things go on. I mean, we all know... Take an established federation like the United States. They spent a huge amount of time arguing about what is done at the centre <coughs> and what is done at the state level. And one of the things I feel strongly about the European Union and the, and the people in Brussels is one of the tests of subsidiarity should always have been if it's done at the state level in Canada, Australia, and the United States, it should not be done at the European level. <coughs> For example, student <coughs> fees, a, a lousy decision which different states have different student fees for universities in the United States. It's crazy that we have this uh, decision in the European Union. Um, so, but, but this is a constant negotiation. What are they doing in Congress at the present moment? The Republicans are trying to cut federal government down to size. If they shrink the budget, they shrink the federal government. Um, and we will go on doing this. British lobbies and the British government have pushed whole swathes of new legislation of the European Union. Animal welfare. You know, as you know, the British are strongly in favour of, of centralising animal welfare and decentralising human welfare. The Germans, even more uh, the, the Spanish, have not wanted to accept all the stuff that the British have pushed on about you know, in terms of transport, sheep, uh, now of, uh, battery hens, etc. That's driven by the British. Minority rights, which we pushed into the Amsterdam Treaty, the British had extensive legislation on minority rights, above all because of the Protestant <coughs> Catholic dimension in Northern Ireland. It caused immense problems for the Austrians, Germans, and others who simply did not have that in domestic legislation. So the idea that we're the ones who resisted European regulation on every front and others have been pushing it on us is actually not historically correct. 
we will continue to be in a situation in which we push for some things, others push for others, and we have to argue about that. That's what multilateral negotiation but is about. But looking ahead, do you see changes that have to be made and will be made? Because this is, this is the current point, whether or not the status quo is acceptable. Some people believe it absolutely is not. And as somebody who's looking at this, do you think there will have to be change, or, or broadly speaking, I, I, I disagree. Right I disagree with those who say we are at a crucial moment when we have to choose between <coughs> shallow integration and, quote, a European superstate. I simply don't see that. I don't, you go to The Hague, to Berlin, uh, to Brussels, uh, to others, uh, and listen to their national debates, none of them are talking about that either, particularly not in the German debate. Um, yes, of course, we need a number of changes to, to cope with the Eurozone. Yes, of course, there are a number of new things which will come onto the agenda, not simply because of the Eurozone crisis. I mean, 20 years ago, we didn't have energy policy and climate change on the agenda we have today. Actually, we had coal and steel. The Poles are the other ones who care about coal any longer. Uh, so new subjects will come onto the agenda as we go on, but they won't all be driven by a federalist agenda. Richard. <laughs> I saw you busily making notes. I just think, you know, on, on this, on this, you, you said earlier that there will have to be changes, yeah. and yes, we yeah. might look at repatriation, but yes. you want it to look differently to Andrea, but what do you well, want well, one to One of the points I, I, I want to make is that we're in danger of missing an opportunity here. What is clear in Europe is there are what I call two economies, or two cultures, beginning to emerge. There is, of course, the northern zone, which I call the North Sea economy. They're like thinking North European uh, fiscal disciplinarians, the Swedes, the Finns, the British, the Dutch, the Danes. They're all natural allies. And on the other side of the equation, there is the Mediterranean economy, uh, who have a completely different culture, a different approach to life. Now, uh, it is clear that within one geographic boundary, those two cultures need to find a way of working together. And I don't see any problems with that. I don't see it as being such a, a, a monumental issue. But I think in terms of giving leadership to that fiscal disciplinarian, <laughs> outward-looking, deregulating uh, northern sector, we, the United Kingdom, are missing the opportunity. Um, of course, we need to repatriate a lot of legislation. Of course, working time directives, social legislation on small businesses is inappropriate for the, the modern globalized age we're, we're living in. Uh, but I, I just don't see it as being such a sort of nuclear option thing, as an evolutionary thing, where we're missing the opportunity of giving that reach. Mary? Well, yeah, actually now the last two speakers have said that we're, we're not at the point where we, we need to do what Richard just called the nuclear option. I mean, and that's absolutely right. I mean, that's really not the way that, that the European Union, or actually individual member states within the European, or most countries, certainly just democratic countries in the world work. You do not actually have a moment when you have to make a, a major decision just like that. And it, that's really what has happened with the debate in the UK. And it's therefore very artificial. There have been those, um, particularly um, the Eurosceptics and the Conservative Party, who have had this agenda, this obsessive agenda, for a very, very long time. And it's all coming together at the moment, and we are all being made to believe that we have to do it now, and this is the only way forward. It quite manifestly isn't. And I'd actually like to go back to something that, that Lord Wallace said earlier about unilateral and multilateral, and, and, and really how... A lot of this is informed by domestic politics. I was actually in the Labour Party during that time. Um, and it was, it was very divisive. It was on a particular issue, which was nuclear disarmament. <coughs> and it actually distorted an entire debate, which became completely nonsensical and totally ridiculous. And, and in the end, didn't, didn't work out. And I think, and I, I've thought for a long time, there are parallels with that, over the way that we are now seeing the European Union. And I think that's very tragic. I mean, both, uh, both, both nuclear weapons and the European Union are hugely important issues. And I think it's very tragic that in this country we are reducing them to very simplistic arguments which really don't mean anything and are not actually translatable into action. Because 
I can actually <coughs> believe that Britain standing on the sidelines of the EU saying we are great, we want this, uh, this, this is what we must have, is actually going to get this country anywhere. Um, and we have never, sadly, really, certainly over the past 20 years or so, been very good at the art of negotiation within the EU. It's not been a great strength of... Of, of the way that the British have progressed. And although we have achieved in the past, as Richard said, the single market and enlargement. Those inside Brussels who talk about European federalism, <laughs> who want to you know, put absolutely everything else into the European element, um, do quote, make quotations, make speeches, which are easy to guide as that's where they're going. So the League of European Federalists might. Dear friend Andrew Duff, um, <laughs> so, makes it, I, I comment and it's all over the, the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Actually, the number of people inside the German Bundestag or the Dutch Parliament who agree with that is minuscule. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to hear from Bill Cash this morning that Bill, as a, 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 a chairman of a scrutiny committee, meets his national parliament opposite numbers every month now. So you know, a number of things have changed to make sure that we are getting round the Brussels model, but it is a real problem that the rhetoric, the old rhetoric, is still there amongst some of the European enthusiasts and some of the and there is colleagues in the European Parliament. Okay, Andrew, yeah, just, just to add to that, one of the things the Fresh Start Project is proposing is that we radically improve the level of pre-legislative scrutiny on EU stuff in Westminster. So, for example, whilst Bill has his European scrutiny committee, nevertheless, very often, when, when it's a financial services directive, it doesn't come to the Treasury Select Committee that I sit on. And I'll be whipped to go and sit on a committee, and it's sort of 11.59pm, and it's like, sign this or you're dead, because it's going tomorrow. <laughs> so it's completely ridiculous. Secondly, Minister for Europe should at least be a cabinet position, in my opinion, because, you know, it's all bunched in with foreign office, and when the Europe minister comes, he's also responsible for things like the Seychelles. The morning. It's very nice for your holidays, but you know, so we, that that needs to be sorted out. And then the final thing I think is we have every week we have business questions in the chamber, which is all Westminster business. And yet, for many departments, much more of what they do is generated in Brussels. So there's a lot we could do actually without even troubling any of our European colleagues by just improving things. And one of the other things which Richard, I'm sure, would agree with is MEP should jolly well have parliamentary passes yeah. so they can come and see us. Yeah. Doesn't that then, part of what you were saying, make the case for saying there isn't a need actually to mess, have messy negotiations and repatriate powers. You just need to make the system work better. No, that's absolutely not what I'm saying. No, I mean, you know, the European Union, if you were creating it today, you would not be creating 40% of its budget on agriculture to protect French farmers. It's just a nonsense. You wouldn't create 30% on structural funds where about... 20% of that gets recycled amongst the wealthiest states in the European Union. You wouldn't do those things. It's like that Irish joke where if you're wanting to be going there, I wouldn't be starting from here. <laughs> but it's, but it's, um, sorry to anyone Irish, I just love that. It just describes the EU perfectly. You know, it's, it, it is at the moment. It, it, it needs substantial reform. And I think you know, the key thing, actually, the thing I do agree with colleagues here is that um, we've got to try and have that discussion sensibly. But we've got to recognise that it has to be had. The fundamental issue is, you know, people compare Europe to the United States of America, but of course they spoke the same language. They had a political union before an economic union. And so the, the cultural differences, all of the fundamental differences in approach that Richard referred to between Southern European approach to fiscal probity versus Northern European and so on, all of those things are exceedingly difficult to overcome. I don't think it's achievable, but what we do have to do is to look at what we can do, what we can share, and make it better in a sensible way. But there is a difference, though, isn't there, between saying the institutions have to reform, the EU itself has to change. There's a difference between saying that, and I don't think anybody in this room would disagree that there has to be change and improvement in parts of the way the EU works. But it's a different thing saying that the UK's relationship should be different. Not necessarily, actually, because the UK is out of the euro, and as a matter of fact, it's obviously out of Schengen. 
And the point is that the EU, the Eurozone, is moving in a different direction. And if you are not a part of the Euro, that inevitably has consequences <coughs> for you, which are not of your doing. So, for example, with the European Banking Union, there will be one single regulator for Eurozone banks, not for British banks. That has huge implications for lender of last resort, for um, guarantees of deposits and so on. And that means that they are moving in a different direction. They're doing, not ours. We have to react to that by saying, so how are we going to deal with the fact that, in, that actually the city accounts for 40% of wholesale markets across the whole of the EU? Now, financial services is a massive industry at EU level, but it's even more important at British level. So we have to square that circle. And to do nothing to say, oh, well, you know, let's just stick with what we've got isn't an option. What we do have to do is to take the sting out of the debate and have a constructive debate with like-minded politicians. And I think Angela Merkel is one of those, by the way, who does completely understand the British perspective and wants to find a solution. And actually, I hate all this talk of what the media do and what, you know, in the past and who said what to whom. I and mean, that's just not constructive. We need to move forward and look to the future and how we can make sure that the Eurozone succeeds because that's in Britain's national interest. Okay, well, let's have some of that constructive debate then in this room. Let's go to questions. And if you didn't ask...